as well. If you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 16. If you'd like to grab one of the pew Bibles in front of you, it should be around page 1,100. I did not check, but I know it's in that. I know it's in there. So 1,100 will put you really close, and we'll be in chapter 16, verse 6. And if your Bible has titles at the beginning of the paragraph, you might have you might have the title in there, The Macedonian Call. And the first time I'd heard of The Macedonian Call was when I was singing songs with my family. We'd, we had done this, started doing this worship time in the mornings at 6 a.m. So we had to be up, we had to be in the living room at 6 a.m. and ready to worship. <laughs> Every weekday, um, that's what my parents started doing while I was in high school. And they would have me sit down with a guitar and I would try to figure out the chords to these hymns. And my dad would, would, my dad would pick the hymns, he'd have copies that he'd made out of the church hymnal. And we'd just go for it. And one of them, it, would, it talked about the Macedonian call. And I had no idea what that was while we were singing it. But I was, and it was, we'd always get to that verse, and I'd, I'd look at that, and I'd go, I'd have to remember how you pronounce it. And I never knew where that was from until later on when I was studying in the book of Acts. And I, I read of it and uh, came to know. So we're going to study that together today. If you remember the, the hymn, the hymn was Send the Light. It said, we have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light, as in sending the gospel. And so this is following after Paul has, has picked up Timothy and he's traveling with him. He's got um, a group of people who are traveling with him, but notably it's uh, him and Silas. And uh, we, we believe that the writer of this book, Luke, was with them and Timothy. But we're going to pick up right at verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So I'm going I'm to stop right, right there. Phrygia and Galatia are actually, he's not referring to cities or towns, specific towns, but he's talking about groups of people. These are, these are different regions of, of ethnic groups and different languages. And so they went through, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So where they're traveling at this, at this point in time is, is we, would, we would call it the, modern, the western end of the modern day of Turkey. This is Asia Minor, uh, that they're, the Ro- Roman providence of Asia Minor that they are traveling. But it says these really interesting phrases that the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go into Bithynia and they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That's a, that's a really odd term. I don't know if you've ever felt forbidden by the Holy Spirit not to be able to do something that you feel like God has called you to do. One of the things that's notable, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is that the Holy Spirit was hugely involved in the development of the church. They weren't just going off of their best guesses. They spent hours and hours in prayer to know what the Holy Spirit wanted to do, what the Holy Spirit was calling them to do. So they felt very compelled that the Holy Spirit did not want them to go into Asia. But instead it started turning them towards Europe, and that's where they're headed. So it says in verse 8, So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul, in the night, a man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace. And the following day in Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, 
a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the gift of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we would, we would bear that gift well, bringing glory and honor to your name. But Father, as we worship today, as we, as we come together with the, your family, your children, our brothers and sisters, we pray that you would use your word to encourage us, to spur us to good works. And Father, we pray that we would band together in, in the love of Christ to help each other be more like Christ. Father, we pray that as we study your word now, that it would, it would cut through, that it would uh, invade our hearts, that we would be turned to you to seek your face, to seek your will in all things every day, that you may use us as your instruments for the glory of of your name, through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So they've been traveling through. They're spending a lot of time in prayer as they're, as they're making their journey. And it says in verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul. They've been praying. They've been seeking. They've been wanting to share the gospel. They have a strong desire to tell other people about Jesus. And they then Paul receives this vision of a man standing in front of him and urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And then when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia. And so this would be the northern province of Greece with Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, notable churches as we read through the New Testament. And they decided together, it says, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to, to them. So this was, that word concluding that is there, it's a term in the Greek of, they made this decision together. It's really what it means. They were united on this. It wasn't just Paul said, Paul woke up in the middle of the night and was like, hey, guys, we're, I know we've been going this way, but we're going to turn and we're going to head towards this province. They, they prayed together. They gathered together. They were convinced that God was calling them to preach the gospel in Macedonia. And so in verse 11, it says that they set sail, but it says that they made a direct voyage. Now, normally when, when people were traveling, they were doing a coastal, uh, they were on a ship that was doing coastal stops, and they would stop at port to port to port, but they charted a direct voyage so that they could get straight there. They went immediately through to there. And we're, we're trying to get there as quickly as they could. And it says, from there they went to Philippi, which is, and the term that they use in the Greek to describe this is the metro area. So imagine like if we were, someone was talking about Anchorage and they were using Anchorage to kind of include the Matsu Valley, which is still really, really far away by uh, our standards of travel. It was not something, you know, we would make a day trip to Anchorage, but it's not like something we're going to go back and forth regularly throughout the day. But they're referring to a larger area around the city of Philippi. And Philippi being the le leading city of this, of this district and a Roman colony. It had been given special privileges beyond just a conquered city. And it said, we remained in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside. So no, there's no, unlike all of the other trips where we've been seeing them going to these different cities and they've been going on the Sabbath day, they've been going to the synagogues. There's no synagogue here. And on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. And it says she was a worshiper of God. So Lydia is named after the providence, the, excuse me, the province. And she had a synagogue in her hometown, but she had not yet fully, fully converted to Judaism. And it says, 
the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So that is in following the command of Jesus as he, as he commissioned the 70. So if you want to write down in one of your notes to look at Luke chapter 10, you can see where he's commissioned the, seven, the 70, and he says, uh, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be in this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. So this was a person of peace. And so they went, they went to her house. She said, come to my house and stay. She's saying, here's my resources I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to lodge you. I'm, you, want, you can use what I have for the gospel. And it says that, that she, she prevailed upon us. So they went and they, they stayed with, with her in her house. What I want to call our attention to today, as we look through this scripture, is that as we see the Holy Spirit work, and move them. It's, it's a radical movement. There are two things that I want to stick out to us today. As we, if we've talked about the development of this church, if we've talked about the development of us as instruments of God's kingdom, the first thing that we need to understand is we, we need to have a great understanding of the gospel. We need to have a great understanding of the gospel. That's one of the things that spurred on Paul and Silas and Timothy. They had a desire to share what they know and what they've experienced with others. They were desperate. They were looking, they were just trying to go everywhere and share the good news. They were convicted. It was a huge desire on their hearts. And it come, that comes from a great understanding of the gospel knowing how important it is to us. How much does it really change our life? When something is important to us, we tend to talk about it. It's something we think about a lot. It's, it's just what comes up in conversation naturally because it's on the forefront of our minds because we're, we're constantly thinking about it because it's important. It's important. And when we have a great understanding of the gospel, when we really look and we continue to dig into the gospel and how much it means to us that, that Jesus has rescued us, that Jesus has paid the price of our sin, that we can be, we can be saved not from any works but by his grace, that's revolutionary for our lives. It sparks change. And so... When something is important to us, we, we talk about that. If that is really something that is actively involved in our lives, if the gospel is active in our lives, it's going to be something we will naturally want to talk about. But there are some other things that we like to talk about. When I, when I talk with a lot of my friends, we like to talk about uh, the stuff in technology that we're into. We like to talk about the, the things that's going on with our work. Um. It's just kind of natural for those things that we're, that we're actively doing, that we're actively involved in, for us to want to talk about. You know, I've, I call my family this time of year, and there's, there's something I can always expect to talk about. College football. It is huge in Alabama. It's a really big deal. I, I was going to call my grandmother yesterday, and I made sure I, I asked Siri, hey, when is the Alabama game? Because I wanted to make sure I wasn't interrupting that. So, uh. It's, it's something they want to talk about because it's something that is, they're actively looking at. They're actively waiting for Saturday. They're excited about. And you may have different sports. You may look at, love to talk about hunting. You may love to talk about whatever it is that, that God ha, has put in your life that excites you. It, but the thing is, what we dwell on, we speak of. What we dwell on, we, we speak of. 
if we have great understanding of the gospel, it changes us from the inside out, and we want to talk about it. We want to talk about it. I was talking with a, another pastor, and he was telling me about this, this young man in his church who was just kind of a mess. He was hard to, to, to talk with. He was just hard to get along with. And one day, he was challenged to sit down and read through the Bible all the way through. And they said over the next four days, I think it was, it was either four, or a week, four days or a week, they, he sat down and he just read and just read. And there was no studying. There was no stopping. He was just reading to get it done. And they said when he came from that, he was a different person. He was, he was completely different. Because he had a greater understanding of gospel, seeing the story from Genesis all the way through with the law of Moses and watching the Israelites struggle. And then he got to the, the man of Jesus Christ, God with us. And he read through that. And he read all the way through to Revelation. When he came out, he was changed. He, he was different. And they said he was different ever since. He didn't just revert back. He said he was, he was different Jesus said in, in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to have a great understanding of the gospel. And part of that comes from speaking the gospel over and over and over again. And I don't necessarily mean to people who are lost. We need to speak the gospel to each other. When someone is discouraged, you know, if one of my friends are discouraged and they're talking about, man, this is, I just don't know what to do in this situation, I said, well, hey, you can just give it over to God because he cares about you. It says it in his word, and you know, I can point them to Matthew 6, where he says his eyes are on the sparrow, so of course he watches you. I said, you just need to turn your eyes on him because he cares for you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. So that even if you've messed up something and you're worried about it, you don't have to because Jesus, Jesus covers that too. We need to share it with each other over and over and over again. With great understanding of the gospel, we also become acutely aware, acutely aware of the desperate need others have without Christ. That word acutely means sharp. We're sharply aware. It sticks out to us. You can, you can see it. It's, there's contrast. I remember talking with a, with a student in Alabama, and she was talking about, we have, we have Bible culture down there. It's a really big thing. Uh, and she said, you know, I look and I talk to, I talk to Christians, and I talk to non-believers, and they all seem kind of like the same to me. There's not that much difference. Everybody's nice. Everybody has manners. But if we are so changed by the gospel, if we have great understanding of the gospel, it's going to change every part of our life, and we're going to become acutely aware of the desperate need others have without Christ. They're gonna, we're going to see the difference. We're going to see the need, and it's going to want, make us want to share it with them because what I have received in Jesus Christ that has changed me and has revolutionized my life, I want you to understand it too. The second thing is we need to be intimately involved with the Holy Spirit. We need to be intimately involved with the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? I mean every day. When, when people get married, you, you become intimate in, in a way more than just talking about physical things. I mean, you really know each other. You're living together. There's no, there's no her space and his space. It's, you're, you're right in each other's business, and you, have to, you actually have to learn to live with one another. And the reality is, is that a lot of us have not quite learned how to live with the Holy Spirit yet. And we're still finding ourselves in a big tug-of-war battle with each other. If 
you've ever met a married couple who you, you can tell they've been married for many, many years and they're not giving up on anything and they're still in that tug of war battle. That's what it can be like for many of us Christians who've not yet learned how to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. To walk daily. If you've been reading the newsletters that we have, if you aren't aware, we do have newsletters that go out every week. You can subscribe to them by email or you can pick them up out there on the Welcome Center. We've got their nice little half pages. But uh, I've been writing about how much does God want to be involved in our daily lives? I had, a, I had a pastor joke with me. You mean, you mean, you really think that God really cares about what pants you put on in the morning? I said, he might. Because I'm, if I'm putting on slacks, but he wants me to go work outside, I'm not putting on the right pants for the job. God really does care, and he really wants direction. He really wants to give us direction for our day. George Mueller is one of my favorite biographies I read as a kid. He was a, a missionary, a German missionary. And one of the things that he's famous for is praying. There was one day where the orphanage that he was serving with and working, working with all these kids, they did not have the money for food that day. And he said, we're just going to pray about it. We're just going to pray about it. He wasn't distraught. He wasn't worried. He was just being matter of fact. We're just going to pray about it. And in the mail that day, they received a box of coins that covered their food. And he turned to the person who'd been asking him where they, how they were going to get the food, and he said, see, even God even cares about the smallest of things. God wants to be intimately involved with our days. He doesn't want to just be a blip on Sunday. He doesn't want to just be a, the verse, the daily verse that we read on our phones. He wants to be involved with us. One of, the, one of the beautiful pictures of Christ is that Christ came down to earth to walk with us. He didn't just, he didn't just pay, the, pay the penalty behind the scenes. He walked with us. He was with us. He got to know people. He cared about people, even in their hurting. It wasn't just about the sin. He was healing people of their sicknesses and healing them of their disabilities. He cared, and God cares for us too. If our church has a great understanding of the gospel and we are intimately involved with the Holy Spirit, it's going to cause us to be united on Jesus Christ. We're going to come together because if we are in the Spirit, the Spirit brings people together. The Spirit does not divide. The Spirit brings us together. And there's a certain energy that we see when we read through the book of Acts as we've read this far where they were just energized. The Holy Spirit was doing amazing things. We were seeing people coming to know Christ in great numbers. And a lot of that is missing from the modern church today. And a lot of it is because we've become less familiar with the Holy Spirit and more familiar with programs and the organization that we have in our churches. So how much of your day involves the Holy Spirit? Well, maybe it's just that the I involve the Holy Spirit in my quiet time in the mornings or in the evenings or when I do it. And if, if the Holy Spirit decides to interject at any time during my day, he's welcome to. How much of your day involves the Holy Spirit and to what degree are you consciously aware of it? These men were traveling, they were traveling, looking to move towards Asia, and they, they were praying and they felt forbidden. That's a strong word. That is a strong word. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word, but they were turned by the Holy Spirit towards Europe. 
Does God direct your day like that? Does God direct your life like that? And what would it be like if we were a church who who united on the gospel and really prayed like that? And we all believed, united, just as they were concluding in verse 10, that God is calling us to do this and to reach people. The last thing I want to point out in this scripture is in verse 14. The end of verse 14, when it's talking about Lydia, who was a worshiper of God, it says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart. One of the things, I've been to many, many church conferences. I've, I've been a part of many missionary conferences, many church leader conferences, many worship conferences, and I've heard over and over again all of the, the different methods that we can use. And they point to these different churches and say, this church saw a great revival because of the pastor and who the pastor was and his personality. Or we point to this evangelism method is what brought great revival to this church and to this area. Or this children's program just really brought tons of people into the church. And many churches would go to the conference and they would take that and they'd take it back to their church and they would see no change. And they'd become very discouraged thinking God has forsaken us. They may not be saying that, but that's what they felt like. There was no method here. They, they, actually, they were doing something different. They weren't doing their normal thing. They weren't going to the synagogue, but they went to the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer, it says. We just, we supposed, we thought there might be. And it wasn't Paul's words. It wasn't the method, the three circles, or the evangel cube, or, or the faith message. But it was the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. We can't do it. We can't do it by any muster of effort. We can't do it on our own. But God has to do it. So my question today is a, is a what if. What if we were a church who loved each other fiercely? Like it says in John 17, what if we had a great understanding of the gospel that it stirred us every day? Not just on Sundays when we sing music, but every day we feel stirred up inside by the gospel and what it means to us. What if we were telling each other that? What if we were encouraging other in that every day? What if? What would it look like? If we were coming together in prayer and we were seriously gathered. I mean, we're not just we're not just here to do our to check off our boxes and to pray for all these people, which are a great thing to do, and we should not forsake that. But we're praying that God would reveal the call of the community on us. What would that look like? What would it be like to see God move in a great way? If you don't know the gospel today, it's very, very simple. There was a law, we broke the law, but Jesus came, God sent Jesus, his one and only son, to the earth. With a humble beginning in a manger, he lived his life, he walked among us, he lived the perfect life, he cared for people, he loved people, and yet his own people crucified him and put him to death and mocked him. And he took on the, a death that we would deserve for our sins and our, our law-breaking to God. He bore that for us. He went willingly to the cross 
in that. So knowing that we would be freed. But he was not dead forever. Three days in the grave, he, he rose again. God raised him from the dead so that death is conquered and we have the gift of everlasting life in Jesus. And the scripture says that if we put our faith in Christ, that we will be saved from our sin. That's the gospel. There's no extra, no extra clauses. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that grace may everywhere abound. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. That a Christ-like spirit may everywhere be found. Father, we pray that you would stir in us the works of the Gospels, just like when we first heard it. The joy that we felt in our hearts, knowing that we were saved by only the grace of Jesus Christ, and that we could lay aside all of our iniquities, all of our wrongdoings. No longer having to rely on our own means for salvation. We pray that you would give us that same stirring today. We pray that you would call us to yourself. That we might come together and pray and seek your will. And we may share the good news over and over and over again, telling the story of Jesus, that it may be written on our hearts and be spoken from our lips. Father, we, we pray. Like many here in the valley, we, we pray for revival. And Father, we know that it's not going to come from any man-made thing, but it's only going to come from you. And Father, we pray that you would help us to surrender ourselves unto your will every day, that you may use us as your instruments for the work of your kingdom. Father, if there's anyone in here who is unsure of what the gospel means or is unsure of whether they are saved or not, I pray that they would be convicted to talk to someone today whether it be me or any of the other people here, that we may share with them the love of Christ and explain to them the scriptures so that they too may be stirred up for the good works of Jesus Christ. Father, for those among us who have grown weary in the work of love. Father, we pray that you would stir in their hearts that same feeling, that excitement that they had when they first heard. Because Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. And we too should rejoice not as dead people, but as those who are alive in Christ. Father, we pray that you would work a movement among your people. 
that brings us together in love and leads us to reach others with the gospel of Christ. We thank you so much for his work. The work that he's done and the work that is still being done in his name for all of your glory until he returns to take us home.